I am here to, to represent some of the, 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 the results coming from the project. So I want to briefly talk to you about two things. I think online and in the room, you can probably see we're, we're going to discuss quickly the diary study with practitioners and the science communication module. So these are two key things to come from the, 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 the GlobalScape project. Uh, and you'll see um, at the top, we're talking about the, the, uh, the GlobalScape white paper. So before lunch, for anyone who joined us, we had an interactive session where we asked for input and guidance. So we're running a number of these sessions to try and make sure that the, the recommendations we finally make with our white paper are reflective of our, of our communities. Uh, in terms of the, the results, so the, one of the key pieces of research that GlobalScape did was, was quite unusual. And I, I think possibly the reason why we, we were uh, funded by, by the European Commission for this work is because we wanted to demonstrate a new type of methodology. I think oftentimes in our space as researchers, if we're, if we're looking to engage uh, a community or participants, particularly around the world, we often rely on things like uh, cross-sectional surveys, which would be once-off surveys where you, you find someone. So imagine you're like a science communicator in, uh, in another part of the world doing great work, and all of a sudden your pal from Ireland turns up uh, online and says, please do this survey for me. I want to capture everything you know about science communication, and then I'm going to write a paper on it. That's generally how things happen, and that's valid, and it's a good way of at least getting, getting people's views. That, that's an important part. But it's only getting their views at one point, catching what they're thinking at that moment in time, and then to make it uh, valid or, or, yeah, to give it, I guess, statistical significance or however you want to think of it in academic terms, but to, to be able to stand over those results, generally what we would do as researchers is just ask lots of people. So if we ask that same question to enough science communicators around the world, we would say, look, uh, hundreds of people have answered this. So therefore, this once-off cross-sectional survey has, has uh, taught us something that we can then share with the world. That's, that was the state of play for us when we were coming into this project. And that's why we decided if we we're going to, to be able to have support from a European project to hear lesser heard voices, we can't just have a once-off cross-sectional survey. So instead, we came up with um, a diary study. And I think for, for those who were around before lunch, we talked a little bit about reflective practice. So stopping and pausing and reflecting sometimes critically on, on the work we're doing. That is the ethos that underpins the, the diary study in, in, in researchers. Sometimes it it's overlaps with uh, reflective journaling. So we wanted to have a project where we would reach out to these lesser heard voices or to, to um, parts of the world where science communication is challenging or difficult or places where we, we, we haven't been uh, listening well enough. And, and then find a way to, to engage them, but not just with a once-off cross-sectional interview. Instead, ask them, would you be willing to, to effectively keep a diary for us? So, so to reflect on your practice um, over time and tell us how, how things are going, which hadn't really been tried before for, for science communication research, and certainly not on this scale where we try to do it in a global space. Uh, so we had to be very upfront with the reviewers for this project and say, this is our project design, our experimental design. This is the, the research and the literature we're drawing on to, to, to make a case for why we think this is feasible. But we couldn't say this is definitely going to work because it hadn't been tried before. So again, that's why we're so grateful that, that they gave us this opportunity to try it. We'd actually initially written that we would try and uh, have 100 science communication professionals around the world take part, which is a small number compared to with, with a, a giant survey, you, you'd imagine there'd be much greater people. But for a, a diary study, we thought it's not just a once-off. We, we need to keep in touch with these people for a year. Uh, and that, that to us was, was the, the, the constraint, the barrier. We thought we, we, we can ask hundreds of people to do a survey, to do a weekly diary study or to keep a reflective journal for us. Maybe we, we can't set our sights so high, which uh, from an experimental design point of view is fine because you have richer data. It's a, it's a longer engagement and, and longitude and qualitative data over time might be um, more valuable for certain things than your once-off cross-sectional surveys, which have been done before. The learning from GlobalScape, and, and this is one of the key results, which is to do not so maybe with the, 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 the data we collected, but more so the proof of the method itself, was that it's, it's something I think that we should, we should do more of. It's, it's, I think we've demonstrated its, its power, its feasibility, because when we reached out through our, our networks, through Excite and SciDev and, and Springer Nature and, and the, the partner networks, 
we ended up with quite a lot of people who were based in different parts of the world who wanted to take part. And rather than, um, rather than have the 100 people we had aimed for initially, we ended up with having more than 900. And over the year of those who stayed, which is kind of crazy, not, not only stayed in science communication, stayed doing that job, but stayed engaged in our bizarre diary study that we wanted them to do for a year, I think our retention rate was above 80% overall. Now, it's actually just finished quite recently, which is why I'm not going to show uh, a bunch of pie charts and uh, stats on the screen because uh, the team still needs to do them, so we don't have them yet. Um, but I mean, general general results we can already see from the diary study. As I say, one, the, the, the method is very interesting and I, I really encourage people to consider it. I think it's something we can, we can use uh, in the future. Myself and the team in Dublin have probably over the next year to try and unpack the data and make an even more convincing argument to try and write papers about the things that we have seen come from this rich data set, which like I say, 900 people over a year in eight languages. So um, if anyone wants to help with data analysis, uh, please uh, please let us know. But we're also, as part because we're part of a European project, we'll be uh, cleaning, curating, and archiving that, that data set as well. So anyone can use it. And that's, that's kind of where we're supposed to be building capacity. There's some things I think as a team we would like to, to, to do with it, but uh, we're hoping that there's even smarter and more innovative science communication researchers and professionals out there who would do something with it as well. So um, just very quickly, broad, broadly, uh, what we see from the, the first look at the data is probably not surprising that there are some things that connect us. So no matter which part of the world you're working as a science communication professional, a lot of the barriers are the same. And I think we've discussed some of them already, like people are, are facing issues with, with funding, with um, opportunities, training, uh, sharing of resources, all of those are, are common challenges. And similarly, things, are, things affect people in, in similar ways. So everyone was affected by the pandemic. It's probably not that surprising, but people through their diary studies were reflecting on how challenging the pandemic was personally and professionally. Um, however, what I'm quite interested in seeing in, in the, the, the weeks and months ahead is unpacking the, um, the specific challenges individual to people and also regions. There's certain parts of the world where even our, our initial looks at, at the, the diaries now that they finish, we can kind of see in certain places that that's where, where we want to go next. Uh, in terms of the science communication module, we'd also probably a little bit ambitiously committed to creating a science communication module and then getting it into a university. Uh, and there's only two universities in the project, uh, Trinity and Leiden. So I was kind of taking one for the team there thinking, I have two years to make this module with our colleagues. And then that's the easy part. Uh, convincing a university, especially when it's a 430-year-old university, to try and teach something that has never been taught before. Um, that, uh, that was a worry. That, uh, I wouldn't say it caused sleepless nights, but uh, I was worried that when we talked about the results of Globalscape, it was going to be that, well, I failed to convince my university to, uh, to teach science communication. But I have to say, uh, I, I was incredibly impressed by, by how forward-thinking a lot of uh, university professionals are and um, people who aren't involved in science communication seeing its benefits. So we have a, a 10 credit science communication module that was developed um, with the team, with the advice of, of um, partners and the experts. And it's still, again, like the white paper, it's an iterative process. So we're in the, the point now of sharing it. If anyone wants to see like a, a module descriptor for, for a science communication module that we're teaching in Dublin. We'd love to get feedback. We'd love to make it available so that people can, uh, can teach it, especially places that might want to teach science communication but maybe don't have the support or resources. Um, and yeah, um, I can say that our students who took science communication as a module for the first time in our university this year, the feedback was very strong, but uh, I don't want to dwell on that because it's too biased. I mean, I taught it, so um, if, if I, it was fine. It was okay. There were some good things and some things we, especially me, could have done better. Uh, so, so they're the main results. De definitely diary study. If anyone is interested in that type of research, um, it's a very small area, but I think it's, it's an area that we should, as researchers, con con continue to, to look at because it's, I think it could be a quite a powerful tool for the field. And then the science communication module, if, if anyone wants to, to see the module descriptor or see some of the resources or help us because uh, we're actually going to develop some, some online um, 
versions of it to, to, to maybe share with people. One last thing, I, and I know uh, you're going to hear from Louisa as well, and she'll mention about the um, the, the PCST uh, teaching forum, which, which is one of our collaborators. Uh, PCST is the Public Communication of Science and Technology Network. But um, as part of that work, which, which again, Louisa will, will mention, uh, we decided we would um, try and gather people's views on their teaching of science communication in university, because that was actually part of the, the original brief from the European Commission in the topic. It said, in taking stock and re-examining science communication, we had to take stock of uh, where it's being taught. So Louisa will talk about that, but we've just recently had an open call for um, papers for the Journal of Science Communication, specifically asking for people to share their stories of science communication teaching in different parts of the world. And we were inundated. Like normally we, we would hope to have 10 or 12 submissions that we could then encourage to submit a, a full paper, but there was 62 from 30 countries. So we're, we're in the process now of, of building on that. We, we've said to some people, we picked basically uh, about 10 that we can move forward with. And to everyone else, we said, anyone who's doing a practice example from a certain country, let's all just work together and create a set of commentaries where we share everything that's happening as practice examples. So, so that's, um, and thank you as well to, to Marina, uh, who you've heard from. Marina's in one of her many roles is uh, one of the editors of, of, of that journal. So, so she's been massive in facilitating that.